So as we dive into this, you know, when we think about worlds and game worlds, I think a lot of us will imagine things like this, which is, you know, the world of Skyrim and, and the Elder Scrolls series, which has got these incredibly rich worlds with a lot of detail, or things like Halo, which is, you know, again, it's a really kind of fantastical world. Um, it takes place in our universe, though. It's not fictional, but it just happens to be in the far future of our universe. Or, um, or things like No Man's Sky, which is interesting because all the rules around world building were basically baked into the code. So everything is procedurally generated in this game. And so all the assumptions about what goes into world building had to be coded into this, um, which I find kind of fascinating. And I think they pulled it off pretty well. Um, even games like Grand Theft Auto, of course, um, there's a tremendous amount of world building that goes into this, even though this is what I would call a hyper real game, because as you can see, the city of Los Santos here is very similar to the city of Los Angeles, which is actually where I'm from originally. So um, I think they did a tremendous job in, in, re in creating this kind of just quasi fictional universe in Grand Theft Auto V, um, which is feels like LA, looks like LA, sounds like LA, but it isn't exactly the same thing. And of course, Assassin's Creed, that series is very well known for using real world locations in, a, in often in tremendous amounts of detail. And then they overlay a fictional narrative um, on top of all of that. And then games like Minecraft. Minecraft is actually all about world building. That's essentially what you do in this game and understanding resource management and understanding the construction and destruction of the world that you're in. And, and and it's just it's so basically it's 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 a world building exercise in the form of a game and a lot of people oftentimes they forget when they when they hear the term world building they often overlook a lot of mobile titles such as limbo here which got a lot of accolades for its visual design but you know there's a lot of world building um, effort that goes into even a game like this you know people would look at a mobile game and say well that's too simple but it isn't there's a lot that goes into it including even angry birds angry hey birds Kate, i'm sorry to interrupt you but can the stream got cut off for a little bit. Oh. Can you can you introduce yourself just one more time? Would that be possible? Do you want I'm me to sorry. go back? Just to inter just a quick introduce yourself and say who you are, and then go ahead and go forward. Okay. Okay. I All apologize. Right. It's okay. So hi everyone, just a quick introduction. Apparently we had a stream disruption that happens sometimes. So I'm Kate Edwards. Um, I'm the executive director of the Global Game Jam. I also am a geographer who's been doing culturalization work in the game industry um, for over 27 years now uh, between companies like Microsoft and then my own company, Geography. And I've worked on a lot of titles you've heard of like Halo and, and uh, Age of Empires and Fable and all the Bioware titles like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Star Wars, the Old Republic and Call of Duty and all these other things that I've worked on. So um, we're, we're talking about culturalization and world building and basically how you can use culturalization to make better worlds for your players um, and to make worlds that make sense. So to, to continue with continue on here, my point in showing these game examples was, was to demonstrate that you know even games like Angry Birds um, has a is a world building exercise. Some people look at it as very simple, and yet there is a narrative here. There's a user experience here, and essentially there's a lot of thought that goes into it, even though you may not see it on the screen. And of course, Rovio has explored the whole world of the of the Angry Birds world in other forms of media as well, graphic novels, movies, and so on and so on. What I, you know, a lot of us who work in the game industry and deal with world building, I think a lot of us come back to Tolkien as one of the inspirations because he did such a phenomenal job of world building when he created Middle Earth. And of course, this map, I think, is familiar to many of us who have hopefully read Lord of the Rings um, and The Hobbit. And so, you know, this world that he created is, is has tremendous familiarity and, and the map itself, this map in particular is actually what inspired me to become a cartographer, um, just because I thought the idea of using cartography to create a fictional world is kind of amazing. Um, but what Tolkien did is he used his strength as a linguist to really build his world. His strength is not a car as cartographer, his strength is a linguist. So he built the languages of the different cultures in this world, the, you know, the black speech and elvish and dwarvish and everything else. And around that he built these cultures and brought them to life in a way that kind of mimics um, the real world. And so we, we respond very quickly to that because in our world, we have cultures and languages and all these things as well. And what's interesting about when he used this map as a way to set the world and to basically frame his world in which the narrative takes place, a lot of authors since that time 
took on this exact same approach because using a map is interesting because it we as human beings when we oftentimes we see a map we assume that it's factual and that it's a real place and so a lot of fantasy authors pretty much in every fantasy book you're going to read they all will have some kind of map in there because it helps set the context for the world and sets the context for the narrative in which everything else is going to take place and so we've seen a lot of these different uh kinds of maps and 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 what i think the authors are often saying by doing this is they're basically saying i was there this was like a real experience for me i went there i mapped it and here's the story that took place while i was there and so it kind of really brings the sense of realism to life and that was just that's just one tool that that uh that world builders use um now why is all this important in, especially in the frame of culturalization well you know, as we know, games are a global phenomenon now. They are the largest uh, consumed form of entertainment in the world. And what's interesting, though, is as you can see from this chart, this latest data, is that most of the gamers are not in where people typically think they are. So I meet a lot of developers, especially indie developers, who are making their game with the aspiration of selling it in the U.S. and Canada and, you know, U.K., France, Germany, et cetera, et cetera, all of which are good targets, but... The, the point, especially from the data here, as you can see with these growth numbers, the real growth is not really happening in those traditional markets. In fact, you can see there in North America, it actually experienced a little bit of decrease in growth year over year. Whereas places like in Asia, it's just exploding still. And of course, China, just in the last couple of years, became the largest gaming market in the world, which I think a lot of us are aware of. So what does all this mean? It basically means when you're creating game content, you're creating it for a truly global audience. And if you really want to make it appeal to, uh, you know, in, to areas which have growth, it's not going to be necessarily North America and Western Europe. And so you have to think about who's viewing your game and who's the audience for the game. And is there anything I can do as a game creator to you know make my game more appealing to these other players in other markets so i think a lot of us know what what localization is we i'm sure you've heard the term it's about basically language translation and so that's been around for many many decades because you know you need to translate the content to make it legible in different languages but culturalization is something that is a more recent concept where it's not just about language translation it's actually about designing your content from the ground up for a global audience and thinking about all kinds of different aspects from the character design to the environments to the ui to the UX experience, everything about how is this going to be uh, seen or viewed in different cultures around the world, because obviously for a lot of game developers, they want as many people as possible to enjoy their game. So here's an example that uh, between localization and culturalization, so here's the Kit Kat candy bar, and you can see in top on the top that's from Canada. It's, it's an English and French wrapper, and the one in on, on the bottom is from Japan. It's in Japanese, and so this is basically localization. You have the exact same product, but it's it, in different languages and a different wrapper. However, culturalization takes things to an entirely different level. So here's the Kit Kat candy bar in Japan only, and what they've done in Japan is they were able to leverage these cultural aspects of Japan that really made this a very popular candy bar. One of the things they did is that the name Kit Kat is very similar to a Japanese phrase, Kitukatsu, which is kind of this victorious positive phrase. So they were able to play off the phrase Kitukatsu and have appeal to Japanese uh, consumers. The other thing that they did is they understood that Japan is a collector culture. So you shouldn't be surprised that games like Pokemon come out of Japan because, you know, gotta catch them all. That kind of thing is, is very much a, one of the Japanese values when it comes to, you know, pastimes and, and collecting and all that kind of stuff. And so in Japan, Kit Kat bars have become this, this phenomenon that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And they even regionalize the flavor. So you can go to different parts of Japan and, uh, oops, sorry, you can go to, oh, I, the map's missing, but you can go to different parts of Japan and collect different kinds of Kit Kat bars. And so this is where they took that concept and made it something completely different. So that's an example of culturalization. Um, so there's two types of culturalization I typically deal with. Um, reactive culturalization is most often what I get asked to do, which is I look in the game and I try and remove elements or change elements that's going to disrupt the user experience. It could be, usually this is something that's going to be negative. It's going to be offensive. It's going to be 
disruptive, I mean, it's a, a symbol that they used or something else. The other aspect is proactive culturalization, where we're looking for ways to enhance the user experience for a specific market or a specific region or culture. And so, for example, when I worked on Forza Motorsports, we actually modified the sets of cars um, to appeal to play people in different languages. So like for the Italian version, it was mostly Italian cars. In the German version, it was mostly German sports cars, you know, and so on and so on. Now you could get any car you wanted through DLC, but, and I don't know why this keeps moving forward, but anyway, um, here's an example in, this was from Fallout 3. This was an example of reactive culturalization. So this two-headed Brahmin bull was sensitive in the Indian market because Brahmin bulls are sacred to the Hindu faith. And there's actual laws that protect Brahmin bulls in India for being harmed, at least real bulls. Um, there was concern, actually legal concern, that the, the virtual version of the bull being mutated and radioactive like it is here would be sensitive enough to cause legal troubles. And now, they so they decided not to change this at all. They could have used my poorly Photoshopped two-headed horse, but they decided not to. So, um, you know, because a horse would have been perfectly fine in this context, it would have been fine for India, but they just didn't have the time and decided that at, the, at least at that point, they said that India was not basically important enough market to, ch to change this for. I think if they made that decision today, they would make a different decision. But um, an example of proactive culturalization in India is where Marvel uh, partnered with a local comic book studio to create this uh, Spider-Man India version. And the initial reaction to this was very positive. People thought this was super cool that they would actually culturalize Spider-Man like this. However, the problem that they encountered with this is that Indian uh, Indian comic book fans and consumers, they know who Spider-Man is. He's Peter Parker in New York City. And so when they're dealing with a very famous IP like Spider-Man, what people really wanted in India was, was localized versions of the existing comic books. They didn't really want a culturalized version of the character itself. Um, but they, it was a good experiment and they had good intentions. And it just that wasn't quite what the consumers wanted. Now, in the in the work that I do, basically what I'm trying to do is, is help the people I work with who are creating these amazing game worlds to see how can they be compatible with the local worldviews into which the content is going to go. And so basically I see this sort of like a gene splicing exercise where I'm trying to see what content assets are going to be compatible or incompatible with those local worldviews and what do we might need to tweak um, if we need to tweak anything at all. Um, certainly I've worked on games where we had to change virtually nothing Thing. And there's other games where there was a lot of substantial changes to be made. And that was based on the goals of, of um, what they wanted to achieve with the game. And so I work in this zone where I'm looking for content issues that may be a problem or, you know, actually could be a better solution. Um, the other difference between culturalization and localization is that culturalization often happens early in the product cycle. So, for example, when I'm working with my client Bioware on a new game, um, we often sit down at the very beginning. We look at the artwork, the concept art, the draft of the script, all of that kind of stuff. So I can understand what is the world they're making, who is in it, what do they do, what's the player experience, all of these different factors. So I get an understanding of what the world is going to be. And at that point, I can make advice on on very, you know, maybe some very simple things they can tweak to make it more appealing to a global audience, or if they have goals for a specific market or region, I can give advice then. Localization often occurs later because you have basically have to wait for the text to be ready to be translatable. Um, and so this is one of the major differences. Now, I still, during the product cycle, even though I do a lot of the work at the beginning, I will go through and do spot checks of content as, the, as it's actually being created. Um, now, there's multiple considerations that we have to think about when this is happening. It's, it's not just straightforward looking at something and giving a thumbs up or thumbs down. For example, there's the high level corporate values and goals. And when I say corporate, that applies to basically anything. It could be you as a single solo developer, as an indie. It could be you and your two or three other in, uh, developers in your startup company. It could be a, you know, whatever size company it is. What I mean is that those who are creating the games have certain values and goals in mind for the game. And you may have to think about, you know, you may make decisions for a certain market that may be counter to your values as a creator and as a company. And so you have to think about that. Do we want to change or, or cross the line with our own values? Also, the content 
in context in which content is created is very important. And I'll get back to this point a little later. Also business strategy for the vertical. So for big companies like Sony and Microsoft, they make more than games. It's not just about games. So they have to think about how do they wanna position their games business against other things. Also the market strategy for a specific locale is important. Also for a specific game, such as World of Warcraft. Um, so if you have multiple games or if you're dealing in multiple markets, it's not that you're, the point is you're not always applying the exact same strategy across the entire world. Um, and then of course, there's always the changing geopolitical, cultural, and ethical factors, because I think as we have been shown in the last few months alone, the world is a very dynamic place and things change very quickly, including culture and politics. And so this is something that I, I spend a lot of time keeping on top of so I can understand this uh, you know, and give my clients good advice. For example, a couple of years ago, the USK, which is the ratings uh, board in Germany, decided to allow Nazi symbology in some games now. So like in these images from Wolfenstein 2, you can see that the images on the left are what we saw in the US and other, other markets. But in Germany, they saw the images on the right um, because you can't possibly tell that's Hitler without his little mustache, right? But um, but they had restrictions on symbology, but now they've relaxed it a bit in, under certain circumstances. And that's a major shift for um, that game developers have to think about if their game pertains to that theme. Um, so let me go on and talk about some of the core aspects of world building that we need to think about. So first of all, they're setting the context, which is really important for a lot of other decisions that will follow. There's the complexity, so the degree of realization that you have to make, and I am gonna explain all this, and also the structure, so how you create the elements that fill up your world. So um, first of all, is it a real world setting or is it fictional world? Now, obviously, even from the examples I showed at the beginning of this talk, it's never black and white like this. I mean, sometimes it is, but for the most part, a lot of games we deal with, there's a broad overlap or in a broad zone between what is fictional and what is real. Like I mentioned, the game Grand Theft Auto to me is what I would call hyper real. It's very close to the real world, but it's not the real world. It's, it's not quite the same. Whereas something like Skyrim is completely fictional. It has nothing to do with our world or our universe. And of course, there's other another axis that I'm not showing here, which is also past and present. There's also a temporal axis here, because like I mentioned, games like Halo take place in our, in our real world, but in the future, and games like Assassin's Creed are real world, but they take place in the past. The other thing that I want to make clear about is when I'm using the term realization, I am not talking about realism. Realism is talking about like photorealism, making it look like it's really, you know, actually real and all that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about realization, I'm talking about how much world do you need to build to fulfill the goals of your creative vision? And so how do you know that? Well, basically the realization goals are defined at its core by two things. One is your narrative goals. So what story is being told here? And like I said, I, I believe that pretty much every game has some kind of narrative, even if it's a quote simple game like Angry Birds. And then there's all the so the experience goals. So what is the player actually doing as they interact with that narrative? And those two things together give you a baseline to understand how much world you actually need to make to, to basically fulfill the goals of the narrative and the experience. And so those are your realization goals. So how do you actually realize the world? There's a lot of different ways you can go about that. I'm going to suggest a few tools that might be useful um, that actually some of these ideas come out of geography of all places. Um, so I'm, I'm going to explain each one of these individually. So, um, but you can see here um, basically what I'm going to talk about. So first of all, cultural evidence. What do I mean by that? Well, I basically mean that once you're creating the world and you know you have a space where you have you're filling up the world with different objects and things, um, this is basically where you want to create use you know basically create the minimal amount of content to convey the presence of an in-game culture or basically whatever your creative goal is with your environment. And this oftentimes is the highest risk activity during game development is that after the concept phase and after all the, the artists and writers and everybody else is kind of they're like heads down creating the world, oftentimes we just kind of passively backfill the game with additional random content because we're kind of filling out the universe or filling out the world, whatever it might be. And a lot of times this, this is where I've seen a lot of people contribute to problems because they're just pulling things out of their imagination, which is great because that's part of what they're paid to do. But sometimes what they actually put down or they pull out is not 
it may not be compatible with with uh, with the overall vision of the game. And so there's two key tips I have when you're creating evidence is first of all, you can't be lazy when you create. You have to always create with a purpose. It's really important. Be very intentional about your creation. And the other thing is that somebody, whether, you know, pre preferably not you as the person who made the object, but somebody else needs to ask those challenging questions where you're not challenging someone's creativity your challenge or their creative ability. What you're challenging is like what was the inspiration for that symbol or where did you get the idea for that character or etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's not it's not criticizing the creation it's basically trying to understand how did you get from this point to this point and what did you, you know what were you using as inspiration so for example when i worked on this game cameo um, this is a great example of lazy creativity, as well as, you know, um, yeah, some other issues. But the, you can see here, there's these two crosses on the side of the road. And this, the game takes place in a completely fictional universe. And so in the in this game, it was called that there would be grave markers on the side of the road. And you can see there's wooden crosses here. Well, the wooden crosses, um, that would be relevant in our world because we have Christianity in this, in our universe, whereas in this universe, there is no Christian faith. So why would they use a wooden cross as a grave marker? And I remember asking the artist, you know, so why, why would, you know, why did you use a wooden cross? And the answer I got back from them is they said, what else would I use? And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe that's what you're paid to do. Think of what a grave marker would look like in this universe. Um, that's being creative. And so that, yeah, it was a little bit of lazy creativity on their part. I also understand that they are probably under tremendous time pressure. They probably had a list of assets that they needed to create that day. And they were probably just going down the list as fast as possible. But again, we have to create with intent and not just kind of gloss over what we add to the world. Another concept that's really important is the idea of logical consistency. And this is also a concept that comes out of geography, of spatial, ge um, especially when we're dealing with spatial data sets where, you know, you look at it, like, for example, if you have a, a, a data set of elevation, and if one point on a flat plane is at 5,000 meters, when everything else is around 50 meters, then you know that that one little point is logically inconsistent with the data. So it kind of raises a red flag. And in the same way, there's things that you might add to the game's world or the game's universe that makes players see that and say, this is not consistent with this world. I don't understand why it's here. Um, and so the crosses that I just talked about, that's one example of logical inconsistency. So you want to make sure that logical rules exist in your world and they're applied to everything that's in that world. You don't want there to be a contradiction between the narrative intent of what's in the world and the content that's that you use to create that world. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's totally fine to have things like magic and all kinds of other bizarre stuff going on, but it needs to be consistent within a system because we as human beings, we're used to understanding systems in our world. We see the way the world works, plate tectonics, weather systems, the, the water cycle, all of that kind of stuff. And using something that feels logical gives the world more relevance and it gives it more actually realism to use the word realism. Um, if that's your goal. So like, here's an example from the game uh, Jade Empire that I worked on where, again, this is a game that was, it was inspired by the real world. So everything in here has a, an Asian influence. So it's in much the way, same way that Skyrim was a, a, fa a complete fantasy game based on European culture. This is a complete fantasy game that was based on Asian culture. And one of the things that one of the artists did is they added these objects. You can see these glowing things in this hallway. Well, what they did is they actually originally added these, which are prayer wheels from Tibetan Buddhism. Now, again, here's you're putting a religious object in an environment in which there should not be there. Tibetan Buddhism does not exist in this reality. So why would you put these prayer wheels in the, in their, the hallway? So you can see how it happened at a very late part in the cycle. So we basically didn't have time to really take out the actual geometry. So instead that we just reskinned it with these glowing blue cylinders um, rather than the symbols that you see there. And uh, that basically just kind of made it mystical feeling. Um, but again, that those having those objects in the environment was not logically consistent with the rest of the universe that had been created here. 
Another thing that's also useful for building out your world is the concept of topology. And this is another concept that is, that is used in geography to some degree. So it's not topography, which is about elevation and distance. Topology is about connectivity. So it's basically the how and why things are connected and not necessarily how far they are or things like that. So for example, right now there's a topological relationship between myself and you because you're an audience and I'm a speaker. So that is a topological relationship that you can define. Um, and so this can apply to anything in your world that you create. It can apply to ideas, to different objects you create, to characters. Um, and what's really cool about topology is that if you use it well, you can convey a much bigger universe without actually having to build that universe. And let me give you a good example of that. When I worked on the original Halo game, uh, Combat Evolved, one of the cool things they did in this environment, especially given that this is a game, a first-person shooter, where you're just pretty linear. You're just shooting things and on you're on a pretty linear path throughout the game uh it, but you're on this incredible you know halo device and you're seeing all this cool forerunner architecture and all this other stuff but you don't really have time to stop and take a breather and understand what what is going on here well what they what they did is created these terminals and if you did take a chance to look around a little bit and you interact with the terminal you actually get a little pop-up screen that has text description that talks about the backstory of this world and kind of gives you some hints about the larger world in which you're running around and shooting things so this little simple technique allowed them to fill out the backstory of the world and have the player get a little more in depth into the world without, they didn't have to do anything other than have a pop-up screen with text. They didn't have to create like a whole nother level. They didn't have to have a whole nother set of exposition or additional characters. They just had this really creative way of having a little extra, you know, world building thrown into the game. And um, I know a lot of people who never, they missed these entirely when they played Halo. So if you play it again, you should look for them. Um, now, one of the things uh, that I get asked a lot is why, why geography? Why is it geographer telling me about world building. Well, I think geographers are actually really well suited for world realization because we spend pretty much all of our time de deconstructing the world around us. And so whenever you see a map of the real world, cartography, it's really about world rebuilding. That's what cartography is. We're taking all the phenomenon that exists out there and then we're organizing it and representing it again in a format that's easy to understand. And the way we do that is we use something called a geographic information system, which basically organizes the world into thematic layers, into data layers, as you can see with this diagram here. And what the GIS is really cool is that we can do analysis between the layers. And so like right now, there's all kinds of GIS being used to help understand the spread of the, the of COVID-19 because we want to understand the spatial phenomenon. How is it getting from one place to another? You know, and what other factors are involved with that? Um, so you can use the same idea and apply the layered approach to your world building as well. So for example, when you're actually going to build your world to realize your world, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of different things you can that you can use to build it out. Um, and this is just a simple list. I mean, this is, list is just very high level. If we weighed it super detailed, this list could easily go down to the center of the earth. But you can see here's all these things that you can kind of pick and choose off the shelf to decide, well, do we really need an economy in our game. No, I guess we don't. Do we have a face system? Do we need language? Do we have, you know, what do we have different species in our game? And there's so there's all of these different things that you can decide, you know, what again is core to the to realizing the world to match the narrative exp narrative goals and the experience goals. And oftentimes what I've seen is that one of the biggest mistakes I've seen on many of the games I've worked on is that they overbuild their worlds. So for example, climatology, when you have a weather system in your game, um, now in some recent games like Breath of the Wild, they've, they've done a remarkable job of using weather to directly affect the gameplay. So all that time they spent creating the weather system was very well spent because they, it was intentionally created to change the gameplay and to interact with the gameplay. Whereas there's been other games I've worked on where they spent a lot of time building out a weather system, but then it didn't really do anything. It was at, it was just there for atmospherics, but it didn't really affect the gameplay at all. And so you kind of have to wonder, was it really worth doing that? Um, 
And so you have to think carefully, what do I really need in my game in order to realize even the most simple form of, of my realization goals? So what I'm going to talk about um, in highlight is some of the most problematic layers of issues I've had to deal with, which often are focused on the reactive culturalization problems that I mentioned earlier. So the use of history, the use of faith, um, and I'll explain these categories more, inclusion, exclusion, something I call intercultural dissonance, and then geopolitical imagination nations um, of governments. So let's talk about history. So you can probably imagine that when you make a game based on real world history, like Age of Empires, Rise of Nations, Civilization, Assassin's Creed, things like that, we have to be mindful of the fact that different cultures view their history differently. Um, you know, the, the, the history books we read from one country to another don't always say the exact same thing. So for example, when I worked on Age of Empires, this was the first version of Age of Empires, we had this scenario where, which this, this really happened in history, at least most historians agree, that when the Japanese during the Middle Ages invaded the Korean Peninsula, which you see there on the left, and they invaded the Chozon Empire in red, and basically took it over for the most part. Um, now, when the game was released in Korea in 1997, um, the feedback we got from the Ministry of Information there is that this never happened. So we were like, okay, um, so what are we supposed to do? Because they would not let us release this game in Korea unless this issue was, quote, fixed. And so we had to have this conversation with the government about well, what 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 do you mean? I mean, what what exactly happened then if, if you don't think this happened? Um, and so we had a long dialogue with the government, but then on the, the development side, on the on the team side, there was a huge debate about ethics and and, and about the nature of truth. And, you know, because what we were being asked to do was to change history, which eventually that is exactly what we did. We set, released a patch only for Korean players that showed it, the uh, Koreans invading Japan instead of the opposite. Now, I again, there was a big debate about this, that this is wrong. Um, this is basically feeding government propaganda, which to some degree it is. And at the same time, it's like this is this was the barrier of entry into the Korean market. Now, you might ask, well, then why did they do it? Well, think back about that multiple considerations slide that I talked about. First of all, this is back at a time when Microsoft is trying to grow its games vertical. So it really wants to grow its games business. This is all pre-Xbox. The Xbox came along a few years later. Um, and they also knew from market research that real-time strategy games like Age of Empires are super popular in Korea. So they knew that if they sold this game in Korea, it would probably be very popular. And if you know your Korean gaming history, one year later, 1998, is when the first StarCraft came out. And StarCraft became a national phenomenon in Korea. And StarCraft is an RTS game as well. And so basically all of these other factors pushed Microsoft to say, we have to release this game in Korea. Therefore, we made this change. And one of the things I noted is that a few years earlier, I worked on Encarta Encyclopedia at Microsoft, which was the precursor to Wikipedia online. And in the encyclopedia in Encarta, we had different heights for the, for the mountain Mont Blanc in the Italian and French versions, because at the time the governments did not agree on the height of the mountain. So again, in an encyclopedia, which is supposed to be absolutely factual, we had different facts depending on the country into which the, the, the product was being sent. And this is very much the same thing. It's a matter of meeting local expectations as well as basically in some cases, it's not just about local expectations, it's about local requirements because some governments, as you'll see later, have legal requirements for what you can and cannot show. So dealing with faith is also very important if you have a religious system in your game and or you're dealing with religious themes can be very sensitive, such as when Resistance Fall of Man came out, they used the Manchester Cathedral in the UK as one of the settings. And unfortunately, they destroyed most of the church during the during the game. And the Church of England was really not happy about this. They actually demanded that the, that the church be taken out of the game, which was not possible at that point. So what happened instead is the Church of England created what they call sacred digital guidelines so that if you want to use a Church of England facility, you have to get their approval first, um, which they probably won't approve it if you're going to destroy it. Um, similarly, they, in Hitman 2, they took the 
intense action of this game, they took it into the most sacred place of the Sikh faith, which is in the Golden Temple in Amritsar, India. And so they basically have the main character sh killing Sikhs in their most holy place. And that was considered really insensitive and, and offensive by a lot of people in the Sikh community. And I can understand why. Um, and then also the game Smite, one of the things that they did is they took the different pantheons of gods in this MOBA and they took like the Norse gods, which are worshipped by just, just a few people still. And they also took the ancient Egyptian gods, which are also worshipped by just a few people. But then they took all the gods from the Hindu pantheon, which are worshipped by around a billion people, and they put them into the game. And so a lot of people of the Hindu faith were really upset about this because they didn't like the, you know, the, the gods that they worship being shown in this way. Way. And of course, some people were joking, why don't you just throw Moses, Muhammad, and Jesus in there and get it over with and just make the game all about a religious battle. But thankfully, they did not do that. Um, inclusion and exclusion is a category in which we're looking for an, where people perceive inequitable treatment of themselves based on the culture as represented in the game or ethnicity or nationality or gender. It could be many different factors, but it makes the player feel like what I'm seeing in this game is not for me. It's actually something that's speaking against me or against who I am. Um, and this is a very broad category, as you can imagine. You know, this game, Resident Evil 5, got a lot of pushback when these images were released before the game came out. And you could see because they had this Caucasian male shooting these sub-Saharan African villagers who happen to be very poor as well. And a lot of people are like, this is wrong. You have this, this person, you know, uh, this white male shooting these people. Now, the, the pushback they got from the developers, the developers said, as you can see on the, the other picture, they said, well, they're, they're zombies, so they have to be killed. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the, what they, the developers didn't realize the, 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 the imagery that this brings up, you know, this idea of the great white hunter and the dark continent of Africa and all these very antiquated, rejected ideas from, you know, many years ago. And so this is one of those things where we have to emphasize, though, the context in which content is generated is really important. This game was developed primarily in Japan. And Japan is 98% ethnic Japanese. And so do you expect someone in Japan to have the same understanding of diversity as we might have in the West? And the answer is no, I don't really expect them to have that same level of understanding. I do expect them to do their research though. So I'm not excusing what they did here, but I am saying that context is really important. And so when we're, when we're developing a game and if we're developing it about a place that we may not understand, that we need to do our due diligence, do our research to make Make sure we understand exactly what we're representing on, you know, in the game. Um, similarly, this game in which you basically torture these little indigenous people on this island, you can like make the volcano explode and burn them and everything. But, um, you know, part of the problem is that, you know, the representation of, it, of these islanders was considered very negative because it's a, another antiquated representation of indigenous people with a bone in their hair and sharp little pointy teeth and all that and the grass skirts but then the fact that you torture them was also a problem now the 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 they got they were getting pushback from different polynesian groups and the developer said this is just a fictional world that has nothing to do with the real world however if you look at the right side of that island there's an object there which is called the moai which exists only in one place on earth on easter island so when they use that object on the island in the game they instantly made this a specific culture and so that's why in later versions of the game they actually took it out and they've just created some fictional little artifact over there um but it's one of those things where by using that one artifact and by the other issues going on in the game, the people from the, that, that particular cultural group felt excluded from the experience. And of course, we can talk for days about female representation in games as well. I think it's fascinating that Lara Croft, who I think used to be was the epitome of sexist representation in video games, has evolved into something now which a lot of us view her representation as something very positive. Like I, I was fortunate enough to work on Rise of the Tomb Raider. And I think the way that she was brought to life, not only in the physicality, but also when you have an amazing writer like Rihanna Pratchett, who brought life to this character in emotional depth, you've now curated went, went, went a character who went from being kind of the epitome of a sexist representation to now being one of the better representations of a, of a female protagonist in a game. 
And then this other category, intercultural dissonance, is important where we're talking about tension that exists between cultures and nationalities for all kinds of reasons. It could be historical, it could be political, there's other factors involved. Um, but I'm going to use another Age of Empires example from Korea because I'm not picking on them, it's just a good example. But this when Age of Empires 2 came out, this box art got a lot of pushback in Korea. And the reason is because of the Japanese samurai that's on the box. Now, it's not because just, you know, because of the longstanding issues between Korea and Japan. The reason it was particularly sensitive at the time this game came out is because the two countries have a geopolitical dispute in the middle of the Sea of Japan, which is called the East Sea by Korea. And it's a little island it's called Dokdo in Korean, and it's called Takashima in Japanese. And everyone once in a while, the two countries have a heightened tension over this geopolitical dispute. Well, the, that tension was very high at the time the game was coming out. And so Korean retailers, they did not want to put anything Japanese related on their shelf, including the box art with Japanese samurai on it. And so this had nothing to do with the game's content. It had everything to do with just coming out at a very inopportune time in the Korean market. And so when the expansion pack came out, um, we actually changed the box art. So most of the world got to see Montezuma on the box art, whereas in Korea, we actually put a Korean general front and center to kind of make up for the samurai issue. Um, basically, it's a way of showing the fans that, hey, we still love you. We're sorry for the samurai. Um, also things like gestures. Gestures can be extremely sensitive. They're extremely culturally specific. Um, like the gesture he's doing there on the left, this that is very close to this gesture, which is the middle finger. And she's doing this gesture, which is kind of this rock on gesture that a lot of us are familiar with. But in Italy, it means I'm sleeping with your wife. So, I mean, it's, you know, gestures are something that are very specific, even within a, in, in a single country, it can mean something different. Like if you're from Texas in the United States, this can mean hook them horns for the University of Texas. So um, context is everything when it comes to gestures. And then finally, geopolitical imaginations. And what I mean by this is basically governments like to reinforce what they think they own. And the way they do that is with maps. And so if you have maps in your game of real world territory, you often might get pushback uh, and you might get into trouble. Um, so like these games, Hearts of Iron, were both banned in China because it did not show Tibet and Taiwan as being integral to the whole of China. What's interesting is that these games, which are basically like the board game Risk, um, you know, you take over the world in different chunks. You can see here that China is divided up into all kinds of pieces, but they, but the Chinese government took issue in particular with with the uh, Taiwan and Tibet. What's interesting though is that these games take place during World War II, which ended in 1945, and the People's Republic of China did not come into existence until 1949. And so the Chinese government is actually reinforcing their sovereignty over these areas before they even technically existed. But then again, that's why they're building islands in the South China Sea right now, um, which we don't need to go into that topic today. So um, another issue is even simple things like in an option screen, where you can see here where it says country select, and it has the flag of Taiwan, but then it says ROC, which means Republic of China. So if you use the term ROC, or if you use the or if you use the flag of Taiwan, both of those will get you instantly banned in China because you cannot use the phrase Republic of China um, because that's basically the term for Taiwan's independence, and you cannot use the Taiwan flag. Um, so this is a very political statement right here. Is 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 in this option screen. There's an easy way to fix it though. First of all, if you check the screen, you take the flag out. You don't need to have the flag because it's redundant information. You also use the term Taiwan, which is acceptable to both sides. And then you say country slash region. So now when you look at this, you say, well, is Taiwan a country or, or a region? It depends on which side of the Taiwan Strait you sit on and what your opinion happens to be. You know, it's a decision that you leave to the user to, to make. It's in their perception. It's not a, basically a political position that you are asserting as a creator. And just as a footnote, this stuff happens all the time outside of games. I mean, I worked a lot with Google to help them do what's called domain tailoring so that when you go to different internet domains, you will see different versions of Google Maps because in India, for example, you must show the northern area of Kashmir as Indian territory or else your map is going to be banned and your product will be banned. And it's just one of those barriers to entry that we have to be thinking of. So as I wrap up here quickly, um, there's a few key considerations to think about in the context of doing all of this world building and thinking about culturalization. First of all is the key audiences that you're talking about. So 
the, the, there's what I call the intended audience. And so these are basically the game players. They they understand games, they play games. They're not really concerned as much about all of these things I've been talking about. Frankly, all of the thing, all that these people really care about is if the game sucks or not. And so they're not focused as much on all the cultural stuff that I was talking about. But then there's the unintended audience, or these are the non-game players who often will have a very violent knee-jerk reaction when they see something out of context. So this could be you know, politicians and people from different faith systems or, you know, parents who are not game players, things like that. And they get really upset when they see like one screenshot or one little thing out of the game and they don't get the broader context. So a lot of the times that the culturalization work I do, the proactive work is done to make a better experience for the intended audience. And the reactive work is basically to help make sure the unintended audience does not have a chance to have a knee jerk reaction. Also, it's very important to point out that when you are releasing content today, you are distributing it in the content cloud, as we know. It's it's You're not really sending it out on physical media anymore. So you have instant exposure to a broad multicultural audience, like immediately. So the moment your content is out there, there's no taking it back. And you know this. I mean, we all know this, especially because we know there's a huge community out there, which is very you know, active, very active communities on social media. So if you do something that they love, you will get this huge outpouring and it's really fantastic. But if you do something they don't like in a particular country or a culture or whatever, you will hear about it and you will hear a lot about it and um, you will hear more about it than you care to hear about it. And so you have to make sure that, you know, do you really want to put yourself in that position by not thinking about these issues? And the other thing to think about as well is that what's really happening here is this battle for mindshare is where governments and cultural institutions are fighting over who gets to influence our citizens. And so of course, games are one of those forms of media that are seen, unfortunately right now, they're still seen in a lot of places as a negative uh, influence on the on citizens that is changing slowly and it will continue to change for the better but this is one of the many reasons why something like the great firewall of china exists to basically try and wall off their citizens from external influence and games are often seen as one of the carriers of a negative influence and of course we don't want games to be perceived that way but if we if we're not mindful of the worlds we're creating and the kinds of stuff we're putting in there it could add to the problem. And then finally, my final point is about freedom and creativity, because I, I know I get asked this a lot when I give a talk like this. It's like, well, wait, I can make anything I want. I, should, I have freedom of speech. You do. You absolutely do. And I and I really encourage people to exercise your creative vision, but you just can't expect that vision to align with other cultural expectations. It's just not going to because the world is so diverse. And so you have to be really conscious of all these just creative decisions you're making during the world building process. And really, it comes down to, again, the values that you want to to put forward as a game company, as a game creator. But we oftentimes, a lot of us find ourselves on this little, basically what I call the fulcrum of compromise, where we want to strive for pure artistic freedom. And yet we also want to maximize the revenue that we're making from our games, because let's face it, we want to make a living off this because we love being game creators. And it's so these are not mutually exclusive, but they are challenging. I mean, they they sometimes can be mutually exclusive because if you want to just create your art and put it out there for the world to enjoy and you don't care what the restrictions are and you also don't care about really making a lot of money, then you can have artistic freedom. And I know people who do this, who are game creators, who just create stuff for the sake of creating. And I think that's fantastic. And there actually needs to be more of that. However, if you're trying to create a business out of this and you want to run a business and you want as many people as possible around the world to enjoy your creative vision, then you have to think about some of these culturalization factors, you know, and that will not only help maximize your revenue, but it's also going to allow your game to be enjoyed by as many people as possible. And, there is no right answer here. It's up to you to decide kind of what your motives are and what your values are and what you're willing to change or not change. And so, and I, and I encourage everyone just to think about it though, when you're creating your game and, and what you would be willing to change or not change, because oftentimes creators are hit in the face with it when they finally release their game. But I'm encouraging you to think about it proactively while you're creating your game. And there you go. There's, there's the end of the talk. So I think maybe we have time for a few questions. Maybe we got like three minutes, um, but we can hit one of the early ones. Uh, let me see. Let me pull it up real quick. There we go. 
any authors you'd recommend in addition to Tolkien to check out? Um, in terms of world building, absolutely. There's, um, yeah, there's there's many many of them. I mean, of course, Frank Herbert, the Dune series is is remarkable. Like that's actually my favorite uh, sci-fi book. Um, you know, of course, there's George R. R. Martin with the World of Westeros. There's um, the Thomas Covenant series, which I I think is a great series. I actually showed the map there. Of course, Chronicles of Narnia, which I also showed. Um, there's many great examples of world building in literature. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good films out there as well. You know, I don't, um, you know, so I, I basically it's, it's, there's too many to list, but that's, that's a few that I would recommend just off the top of my head. I, and, and last one, and I put up a note, Kate's got to give her uh, GDC talk like immediately after this. So she's going to bounce, but if you put yeah. your questions in the post-show chat uh, on the discord, she will get back to them as soon as she can. So the last one, what if you're making a comical game? Is it acceptable to poke fun at cultures, religions, and so on? Um, the answer is yes, but you got to be super careful about it. I mean, obviously, South Park has made this their business. South Park is a master at how they do it. And so I would look at someone, something like The Simpsons, South Park, and some of those other media that have done a very good job. Uh, basically, they, they hold nothing back and nobody is free of their criticism. But it's not criticism. They do it under the, the, the framework of satire and parody. And, and of course, you're protected under free speech laws, at least in the United States and in most places here and there with, if you're doing a clear parody, then that's fine. But you got to make sure it's really clear that that's what you're doing. Because if it's not clear, then people are going to take very quick offense that you're just being mean spirited and whatever, you know, the an angry, you know, game creator who's just making fun of everybody. Um, so, so I think, yes, you absolutely can do that, but just make sure that the comical context is super clear. All right, Kate, we're going to let you roll. Uh, thank you so much. And thank like you. Said, Kate's around on the Discord. Uh, she's generally there in one shape or form. And so she will be able to answer questions when she gets done with her next presentation. Uh, yes. We're going to roll over. We've got a showcase of around eight or 10 awesome developers and companies from Argentina, uh, spanning game dev devs up through uh, service companies. And so we're going to go into that. And thanks. Really bueno. Yeah, awesome. Exactly. <laughs> Bye.